The spirit of slavery leads to fear. The spirit of freedom leads to courage, which is not the absence of fear, but the overcoming of fear. When you are a free person and you understand that your life, it's contingent upon you to live the life the way that you're supposed to, then all of a sudden you have courage because you've got to. You can't rely on somebody else. You can't wait for somebody else to take care of you. You have to do it. Which means that you start seeing things through a spiritual lens. You have to or else it'll drive you crazy. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place, and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Because of everything that we've been talking about, I just thought it was appropriate to suspend the series we've been doing on 1 Samuel just for today and talk about this because we've talked so much today about fear and how big a part it plays in not just this with the coronavirus, but in the human heart in general. And God really understood this and has for a really long time. And so he speaks to us through Paul, through inspiration, and we're going to go ahead and look at Romans 8, verses 12 through 17, keeping in mind that really, even though we're commanded to fear God, that's really the only thing we are commanded to fear. Everything else we're commanded not to fear. And Paul illustrates that very well in Romans 8, 12 through 17. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting, death the de putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and that, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I really love this passage of Scripture, and always have. Romans 8 may be the best chapter in the entire Bible. I mean, maybe other than the crucifixion stories, because there's four chapters, one in each of the Gospels, and really there's some spillover in Luke. But anyway, if you're looking at those chapters, I think you could say that those are better. But as far as, like, in the epistles, I think Romans 8 is probably the best chapter for sure in anything past the Gospels. And this is a, a great example of why you see how it starts out there. Contrasting flesh and spirit, it's saying that the, the people of the world, your average person, they live by flesh. We're not supposed to do that. We're Christians. We live by the Spirit. It's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different lifestyle. We should be noticeably different to other people because we are living by the Spirit and being led by it rather than being led by the flesh. Our worldly desires, our hungers and appetites, whatever our body wants, doing whatever we please with that, we don't do that. We're led by a higher calling. We're led by the Spirit. And he starts out with making that contrast, and then he makes this other secondary contrast of fear and being a child of God. These are not coincidences. So when he draws that contrast between flesh and spirit, he then, at exactly the same time, right afterward, says, and there is also a contrast between fear and being a, a child of God. In other words, if we are a child of God, then we have nothing to fear. 
If we believe that we are going to die one day and be with God in heaven, then what do we have to fear on this side of eternity? Why would we be afraid of literally anything that could happen to us here? That doesn't make any sense. And it's not saying that you need to be reckless to the point of being suicidal or anything like that. Obviously, you shouldn't just be, you know, running into to traffic and anything like that. That's not what Paul is saying at all. But he is saying that there is a, a spirit of fear, in other words, a lifestyle of fear, that controls people, that fear is their driving factor, that they're, they're too afraid that they might get hurt, they're too afraid that they might die, and that could end it all. And so because of that, they listen to their fear and restrain themselves from doing what they need to do because of that. Christians aren't supposed to be that way. Christians aren't supposed to have that spirit of fear. Why? Because we know that we are led by a completely different mindset, that our fears do not control us. They're there, and sometimes fear can be a good thing. Sometimes it can warn us about dangers. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. When it becomes a bad thing, is what Paul is talking about here, is when it starts controlling you and dominating your life. And let's look at, for a second, what it would mean to be a child of God, because that's the contrast here. Fear versus a child of God. Well, if you are a child of God, then there's a level of intimacy there. In fact, the word that it uses at the end of that, Abba Father, that is an incredibly intimate term in the original language. What it specifically means is it's, it's a title or a phrase that indicates closeness to a father, specifically one between a child and their father. And the reason that that's so significant is because it talks about us as being fellow heirs. In other words, we are the brother of Christ, a fellow heir in the inheritance that he has extended to all of us because he has that intimate relationship with his father. Remember the Abba is also the term that Jesus Christ himself used calling out to God in Mark 14, 36, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and about to face his greatest trial. What Paul is saying to the Christians at Rome here is, you have an intimate relationship with God. You are as close to him as Jesus Christ was because Christ has come into this world and given us the opportunity to have that kind of relationship with him, to allow us to draw close to God through the sacrificing of his own blood and washing us in it. Because of that, we have the same kind of relationship that Jesus Christ had with his father. And if that's the case, what do we have to be afraid of? You remember when Jesus calms the storm and says, peace be still, and, and stops, the, stops the waves and the storm that's there on the Sea of Galilee? Do you remember what led up to that? Jesus was in the boat, asleep, in a storm at sea. And when they wake him up, he's like, why, why'd you guys, why are you worried? You realize I'm with you, right? That I'm the son of God and that he's not going to allow anything bad to happen to me? See, that's the kind of confidence that Christians are supposed to have. That if we're with Christ, we're buried with him in baptism, then we have that same intimate level of relationship with God that Jesus himself did. And that means that there's really nothing here on this side of eternity that should scare us. Was Jesus Christ afraid to be crucified? Yeah, he was. So much to the point that he was literally sweating blood. And yet, despite this, he did it anyway. He was obedient even to the point of death. Because he wasn't seeing the world through fleshly eyes. He was a child of God and acted like it. He didn't let his fear control him. He didn't let it dominate his life. He didn't keep it from doing what he needed to do. He went about living his life the way that he should, the way that God commanded him to. And I want you to also take note of, it says at the very beginning of that verse, where it talks about we are under an obligation not to the flesh or live according to the flesh, and then it goes on and says that it is the spirit of slavery that leads to fear. You see, 
there's been an awful lot of fear over this thing over the past several months. Because of that, there's been an awful lot of slavery. A lot of people that are obligated to, through no fault of their own, either stay home or wear a mask or whatever you want to throw out there. I'm not saying it's exactly the same as like working at a labor camp in Auschwitz. I'm not suggesting that. But there has been a curtailing of freedoms because of fear. And that's something that God acknowledged as part of the human condition, and that's why he brings it up here, is that that spirit of slavery is what leads to fear. If we're still slaves to sin, if we're still slaves to this world, if we still think like the world wants us to think, then we are going to be subject to its slavery and the fear that comes with that. You see, that's why America is different. The spirit of slavery leads to fear. The spirit of freedom leads to courage, which is not the absence of fear, but the overcoming of fear. When you are a free person and you understand that your life, it's contingent upon you to live the life the way that you're supposed to, then all of a sudden you have courage because you've got to. You can't rely on somebody else. You can't wait for somebody else to take care of you. You have to do it which means that you start seeing things through a spiritual lens. You have to, or else it'll drive you crazy. And so overcoming that spirit of slavery is what leads to us overcoming our fear. See, if we're fellow heirs with Christ, if we are sons and daughters of God with Him, then we need to act like it. We need to live in peace with all men. That's later in this same chapter. That's in Romans 8. And so I understand that. I'm not saying that we do whatever we want or it's a license to live how we want. It's the opposite of that. It is freedom coupled with responsibility. But ultimately what it means is we don't have to be afraid of anything on this side of eternity. We can live our lives the way that God intended and the way that he instructs us to, free from fear. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.